Uh, hey everyone, my name is Robert Hernandez. I'm a digital journalism professor at USC Annenberg where I teach uh, immersive and um, uh, uh, emerging journalism uh, to my young students and in that we've been doing VR, AR, wearables for the last couple of years. I'm your moderator today on a panel uh, called VR, AR as change agents, whether it's for social, news, documentary, and political media. And we got a pretty badass panel here, diverse representative panel from different angles. Uh, and I'm going to have you guys, uh, I don't know if you can see the screen, but I, I'm AP style, alphabetical by last name. I'm uh, going to have you guys introduce yourselves uh, and uh, some history perhaps of stuff that I know of you guys, uh, kind of like to, to tag to make sure uh, you hype yourself uh, enough. I'll be your hype man if you are not your hype man or woman. Um, but let's kind of go alphabetical. You see their names up there, their faces, not a bit emoji uh, for one person. Uh, but their Twitter handles as well if you want to connect with them afterwards. But let's, let's start. Uh, introduce yourself, uh, what your work is briefly, um, and then um, we'll kind of then have an informal conversation. What I want us to do is a lot of Q&A. A lot of knowledge sharing from this great group, and I'm sure this audience also participates in this space as well. Um, and that's what we'll do for an hour. Uh, so BC Beerman alphabetically is up first. I've known BC for many years now. I am his uh, unofficial hype man. Uh, I invited BC to this panel because he does augmented reality all around the world for many years. BC, talk about yourself. Uh, OK, so thank you, Robert. Um, it's good to be with everybody today. My background is, is sort of split um, in three ways. Uh, academia, um, the arts, and also sort of a, a policy informant. Um, so let me give you sort of a 30-second overview, and then I'll sort of get into my work. Um, as, an, as an academic here in Los Angeles, I was researching billboards, graffiti in, in LA, sort of the, the legal disconnect between the two. Uh, I have a partner in, in New York who was at the time uh, taking over street art, or, or excuse me, advertisements in public space and curating them with street art. So taking out advertisements from, from public uh, space bus stop shelters or billboards and then replacing them with, with street art pieces. Uh, we had a meeting in, in New York. I said, look, man, there's a, a technology uh, somewhat nascent, but it's coming out in terms of mobile, which may, means it's accessible, and that's augmented reality. This is about eight years ago. Our first project was, was taking over all the ads in Times Square uh, virtually with, with curated digital street art. And our work kind of took off from there. So we've been doing this all over the world now, uh, and then also our own large street art pieces uh, that come alive in, in AR. Uh, so that kind of brings you up to speed just in a nutshell in terms of my own work. My interest ideologically in, in this technology is, is split in a couple of ways. One is that AR, is, is a present technology, right? It keeps you present in the space. As a matter of fact, it's contextual. The best uses of AR are contextual to the space that you're viewing it in. Uh, AR, or VR is, a, is an absent technology. It remove, removes you from the physical space. It can replace it with a new one, but that is an absent uh, virtual digital space. So with, with, v, or excuse me, with AR, for us, the proximity to public spaces, the city spaces, was what really engaged us. Uh, now, this can bleed into a number of areas, not just arts, uh, but in terms of storytelling. The city as a read-write canvas uh, has so, many, so much potential in terms of in situ public space storytelling. Uh, and that's kind of our, uh, how we've pivoted in some ways in terms of our work from, from augmented reality street art into uh, public space storytelling. Cool, cool, welcome. Uh, next up is Dylan Roberts. Dylan and I swapped emails some time ago as he was going uh, to the Middle East. Uh, and we finally met in real life today. Uh, and a uh, really interesting background. Talk about yourself and your work, sir. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm from Austin, Texas, and currently look. Oh, sweet. <laughs> um, and I'm currently based. Uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and wow, it's a small world. Um, and so, yeah, we uh, my company is called Freelance Society, uh, about four years old now. Um, and so, 
primarily countries that we worked in was Middle East, uh, Africa, and some Latin America. Uh, we started getting into VR with my business partner, Christian Steven, um, with uh, Riot um, back in end of 2014, early 2015. And we uh, did some of the first uh, 360 films inside a war zone, like Aleppo, Syria, um, that Christian Steven um, filmed, and um, we coordinate the access with it. So a lot of what we do is we specialize um, in access in complex countries, um, conflict zones, as well as natural disasters, and we really take pride in to having really strategic local partners in different areas because um, we believe 360 and access into a story, really challenging access is the key, and that's kind of our motto, um, putting people where it's very difficult to get to. Cool. Um, so that's kind of, so we really f only do about three to four films a year in VR. Um, we're really strategic and we work with amazing different partners. Um, our last, we've been focusing on Iraq on different n number of projects, um, mainly Mosul. Um, we even have footage going back a year and a half of before Mosul um, was gonna be retaken. Um, and we all, all the way leading up to, um, we'll go back in June of what does it look like and what's the rebuilding process of it and what does it look. So really seeing how can VR and 360 long format investigative um, pieces look. Um, and uh, we also in Oklahoma, mid-America areas, um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about education, uh, 360 journalism um, this past uh, this year, um, we did the first VR 360 panel, um, an event, a two-day panel, which Tyson Sadler, Sadler over there was one of my speakers. Um, and yeah, so we, um, my background has been in journalism and video production, yeah. and uh, VR and 360 has, has been great, giving journalists another way to, to work and uh, to tell different stories. When you uh, say VR, you mean 360. Yeah, correct. Right, that's a little nerd definition, but I don't know if we have you know, nerds that fight over that stuff. It's immersive. Either way you look at it, I really don't care what it's called, but it's immersive or mixed reality. We'll talk about that. Next up, uh, we're going to skip Angel to see if he shows up. We can mock him if he doesn't show up. Uh, Kevin, uh, who, hold on, let me, let me be your hype man for a moment. Uh, okay. Kevin uh, is the guy who taught me how to stitch, even though technically speaking, I eventually became his professor uh, at Emblematic, uh, the company run by Noni de la Pena, the godmother of VR. Kevin, talk about yourself. Hi, yeah, we are a VR journalism studio. Um, you know, we've produced um, some of the pieces that are on there, but um, we're wrapping up our year-long partnership with Frontline PBS where we're exploring how to do investigative journalism in a walk-around VR um, type of storytelling environment. And um, what else are we doing? Uh, this is our first piece called After Solitary and that premiered at South by Southwest. We're really interested in not only making people, I mean, sure making them care about things that they might not care about, um, but telling stories in a way that make people understand the news differently. Um, I think that's our main goal. We developed the Wall Street Journal's Augmented Reality Project Tango app where you can um, see the stocks live on your desk and kind of get a sense from a tree map of how they're feeling. Um, So you guys do some amazing stuff, kind of like yeah. for me, the cutting edge of true VR, room scale volumetric, photogrammetry, and mashing that stuff together. Yeah, uh, we awesome. do kind of software development, storytelling, everything. Yeah. Cool. And Kate, we met uh, over the phone 48 hours ago, 72 hours ago. Um, I'm not going to pronounce your last name. Kate W. is from Here Be Fucking Dragons. I included the F-bomb there because the work that you guys do and have been doing under the different names, uh, kind of like sister companies, has been leading edge in this immersive uh, community. Introduce yourself and talk about what you work on. 
Hi, I'm head of camera at Here Be Dragons, formerly known as First. Uh, we are partnered with Within, um, and we've done a lot of documentary work with the UN and the New York Times. Uh, last summer, we put out a five-part documentary series about emerging science and tech called The Possible with GE. And uh, most recently at Tribeca, we debuted The Protectors, which was a documentary we partnered with uh, National Geo, Catherine Bigelow, and one of our directors, Imran Ismail, um, to follow the rangers that protect elephants from poachers in uh, the DRC. And we also debuted a um, walk around uh, room scale Holocaust testimonial um, partnered with uh, MPC and the Shoah Foundation. Uh, so we do a lot of custom camera solutions, custom shooting solutions, and we'll work with directors to figure out the best way to go into the field and uh, document whatever their subject is in uh, the most immersive uh, 360 3D way possible. Cool. Well, thank you guys for joining us uh, today. The panel, again, is talking about how this media, uh, this new emerging technology can be a change agent. Um, and all these different aspects, each one of you is coming from a different angle. Uh, my first question to you guys, oh, I should introduce myself a little bit formally. Uh, my students and I produce immersive storytelling under the name Javernalism, so it's a cute little typo. Journalism instead of a U, it's a V, see the VR, what we did there. Uh, we've worked with the New York Times, NPR, ProPublica, we're in the middle of post-production uh, on uh, a series about the Salton Sea um, with the Desert Sun and Gannett. Um, so, my question to you guys first is, there's so many platforms, why are you picking VR or AR to be that change agent? What, 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 is the, what is your answer when people say, well, I can do this stuff in 2D and in traditional forms? Who wants to take that first? <laughs> Kate, well, go first. It's a, it's a whole different medium. I don't think you can compare it to what we call flatties. Uh, which is not just because there's you know there's 360 and then there's 3D 360 and then there's VR then there's AR so anything on a 16 by 9 or 4 by 3 uh, rectangle we call flatties um, we just approach it as a different medium it's why would you use a paintbrush versus a pencil um, it it mm, delivers good. a completely different set of goals and way of communicating with your audience I'm tweeting out hashtag flatties DC what were you gonna say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, we we maybe uh, stupidly turn work away when people come to us for augmented reality when they don't need it. Um, augmented reality for us is a physical contextual technology and that's the power of it. The power of it is that you can move in, in space and the assets remain perspectival to your movement. Um, this should have some meaning for what I see digitally to why it's placed there, right? There should be some connection and that should be some sort of meaningful connection. Um, Silicon Valley is, is sort of falling this trap. Uh, Hollywood to a certain degree is that they're chasing shiny objects because they're new. Um, how can I apply them to, to my discipline? It's a good question, but in terms of, just in terms of straight up consultation, it's, it's really helpful to know the power of each medium. Um, I've explained a little bit about the power of AR. VR in 360 is, is, is the lack of frame. Uh, in some cases, it's you need a frame to tell a, to tell a story. In some cases, the, the lack of frame is a more powerful way to tell a story. So ultimately, it's the ethos of, of what you're driving at, what you're trying to do, what your core values are, and how, how those technology stacks fit with those, with those values. Dylan, what made you pick up a 360 camera to go to a war zone opposed to staying with traditional cameras? What, what's the benefit? Um, I think is one of the benefits I think it's, it's almost true storytelling where you can't hide anything and so Except much- Except yourself while you're hiding. Exactly, not being yeah. Hiding. So much of the shot is where can you place the camera and then you think about yourself after. Good. Um, but what I love, so conflict zones are very complex and they're not always action happening all the time. Um, it's very rare actually to be in a firefight. You, you really have to put yourself in a, in a really bad situation. So I love 360 just because it's almost true storytelling and you can't hide the atmosphere of that story. That's, that's what I love about it. Kevin and Emblematic, you guys use all this stuff and there's, it's a wide range of stories you yeah. guys have produced. 
Um, what would you say is the common thread and why you use the technology for those wide range? Uh, just for context, for those who don't know, you've done domestic violence, there was the hunger thing, which was the first piece that Adnan Noni did. There's been Project Syria with the rocket blast. There's the stuff with the border agent, uh, Trayvon, uh, Kenny after solitaire. A lot of uplifting stories, I guess. <laughs> That's journalism. Uh, but yeah. what, is the, what is the through line of those projects and um, why this technology? You know, one example that um, I think is really telling of why we use this technology is our piece that we had at Sundance two years ago. And it's called Across the Line. And in that piece, um, it was, it was, we did it in partnership with Planned Parenthood and all their... Um, their like source audio that they got was real. So you're listening to what, you know, real protesters are yelling at women as they're walking into health centers. Um, and the reason why we chose VR and why we wanted to do it specifically in, in the game engine is to make sure that the protesters are making eye contact with the viewer. And you can't do that in any other medium to have, you know, like someone looking at you and call you a slut or a Jezebel or, um, you know, you should close your legs. and um, that was the power of being acknowledged is because when you're looking at a movie or even a 360 video people are looking past you and you're not you're invisible and you don't have any sense of agency or weight in a space and for us um, the technology really came forward with having the game engine interact with the viewer and tracking the viewer as they're walking around I haven't done that piece yet. What were some takeaways from that piece? Like people coming out of it, how are they responding? Yeah, so Planned Parenthood has been using that as a research method. Um, and what they found is that people who um, you know, are um, anti-abortion, um, they will go in a, into this piece and they will come out probably still anti-abortion, but they believe that women should not be treated this way. Oh, and right. they think that the protesting is a really like wrong way of um, between young women who are going through serious issues. Yeah. Um, I have lots of questions, but I want you guys to ask questions, but we are live streaming. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm gonna put this microphone over here for folks to come up, come up and ask a question anytime you want. Uh, please come on up, you have a question, come on up. How did that story come about? How did you guys decide to do a Planned Parenthood story? Um, no, I wasn't there oh, when okay. we were well, with, That leads but, to um, a question uh, <laughs> before you ask yours. One of the things that I see about VR, and I've written about it, and I almost committed this sin, which was going to be a male-only panel, because one speaker fell through, and I was like, shit, uh, I know a lot of badass women in this space. They've taught me how to do this stuff. And I scrambled, and all of these badass women are, are busy. Uh, so they couldn't do the panel. Uh, and, and then Kate, we met. I hope we're going to be friends. Um, but that is something that I notice is a problem that could happen and it is happening in this industry. The diversity and the lack thereof of perspective, whether it's gender or ethnicity or orientation. How important is that for you guys and where you're working? How is that baked in? Because you can't have, you know, change if you don't have all those perspectives in the mix, in your team. How does that manifest? How does diversity of perspectives, diversity in any which way that you want to interpret, manifest in how you work, where you work, how you select stories? Do you, uh, let me ask that question. Anyone? Kate? Yeah, uh, I'll try to answer that. That's a big one. Um, I think when you're, you're presenting, when you're in a headset, you're only in that perspective. It's so much more powerful than that square um, because you are in, you are a character as the camera and there's a lot of, there's a lot of wrong you can do with that and there's also a lot of good you can do with that. So in our stories, we're pretty diverse in terms of our filmmakers, in terms of where we go. Uh, I mean, our staff is, is half a woman. So okay. we have multiple voices chiming in on each project saying, yeah, that's good, but let's bring another voice to the table. So you can see that in the countries we've worked in. We've worked in Indonesia, Syria, um, the DRC, um, uh, most, yeah, all over the world. And I, I 
think that as an emerging medium, you see a lot of people right now speaking up and saying, hey, let's change this. Let's not do another Silicon Valley. Yes. And you can see that, I mean, in the Women in VR Facebook group, which is huge, there's a lot of people that will speak up and say, hey, at that trade show, you had booth babes for your product. That's not good. And the industry immediately says back, you're right, sorry about that. Um, so I think we're so early that we can still change Shape it. it. Yeah. yeah, and emblematic is pretty diverse too. Yeah, right. we're, we're female, Latino-led, um, all of, of entire, pretty much our entire team is majority, like people of color, um, and I think that's really important to us because that infirm, informs all of our pieces, and our pieces claim to be things that are, I mean, they're, it's journalism in one sense, but it's also, you know, showing other people's perspectives. Cool, yeah. cool. Um, is anyone a member of the Women in VR Facebook group? Only one? If you're interested in the space, uh, you should join it, and you don't have to be a woman to join it. You can be an ally there. I hopefully qualify as an ally. Um, uh, your question. Um, well, full disclosure, I, I actually do teach master students in how technology affects human behavior. Good. So I, I do understand what you guys are doing, and I've actually researched for my dissertation a lot of what you guys have done. In fact, I'm going to be citing it. So um, but my question is, and it, and it relates to the research I'm doing about what is the emotional reaction of um, uh, viewing a crisis in VR. Now, we all know it's an empathy machine. We all know that you know it's a, an intensely emotional experience for a million different reasons, including perspective taking, immersion, um, uh, perception, all of that. However, what do you find being on the front lines, doing this work, and seeing what are the emotional reactions? Is there something is too emotional in this particular medium, and in particular viewing it in a crisis? Yeah. So I would tag it a little bit in terms of, is it hype or is it real that people are changing, uh, having a true different type of reaction compared to watching a, a flatty? Um, and then, is there a line, and do you think about that line when you're producing that content? Uh, yeah, this is a constant struggle. Um, so where I'm, so my one of the latest projects we did was follow medics on the very front lines of Mosul. Um, and so when someone gets hurt, yeah. immediately someone comes to this first station, or they're not even really stations; it's just tourniquets and bandages. So. You would see everything from kids being, you know, hurt or dismantled, or I can go on and on. So, when you collect all that kind of footage, how can you put that together where that's not the only focus, but you're really capturing the environment of Mosul, um, in this instance, the medics and how they're helping. Um, so, I did a screening in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where VR is still very rare. I'm probably one of five that has a headset. Yeah. And um, so when they watch some of those films, um, yeah, I would say it definitely changes their perspective um, overall. Uh, so, um, and Robert and I have a couple of colleagues at USC that you might want to add to the list uh, who are doing much more immersive work in this field. Right? Uh, P, uh, they're, they're using VR to treat PTSD Rizzo. patients, Rizzo. Skip Rizzo and yeah. Todd Richmond. Um, it's sort of a jury still out question, right? Is there enough qu uh, quantitative evidence to support using these techniques? Um, that's a good question, right? And that's still being sort of fleshed out academically in, in other disciplines. You know, they treat PTSD with this immersive environment, but what if about it gives PTSD? I mean, I've right. ripped, ripped that headset off a couple times, like, mm -mm. Uh, completely agree, and, and in this sense, in, in the same way, like every tool, right? Um, it can be sort of a very powerful torture device that you can't get out of. Um, you don't know anybody that's done research along those lines yet. Stanford ha uh, has a center. I've been there, the Balenson's work? Yeah, where they're uh, capturing emotion and impact and that effect, so I, I think they're the ones who have done it. Um, but as you create this content, is there is there a moment that you're like, no, you guys, this, this scene too much, yeah. is too much? Uh, Kate, you, you. Um, this was uh, not in a current crisis, but when we were working on the Shoah Foundation piece, uh, Last Goodbye, and we documented all of the rooms in this uh, ho this concentration camp, Midenic, with photogrammetry, so that the viewer would be able to be there 
and we interviewed the survivor, uh, Pincus, in the same room, and we had to pay like very close attention to, we shot him in that room, we didn't artificially place him there, but there was a question of when we got to the gas chamber, what do we do about that? And the answer was, you can't put someone in there. Like, that's unethical, that's too much, and that's using Me, the our viewer? Power. Yeah. And is, is that, is it open to the public as an exhibit? It's an open door, but you're not supposed to go in there. But you're okay. walking through, you see, you see the gas cans to your left, you walk down the hallway and you see the door to the gas chamber, and we said, no, we can't do that. Similarly, um, when you're in the final room where, uh, in the crematorium, Pincus wouldn't go in there. And so we couldn't put him in there. And we said, you, the viewer, can be there, but we'll make it a point to show you that Pincus will not physically go in that room. And that's for journalism as well, because that's true. You know, so that's wonderful. Thank you. Can, can I just say one last yeah. thing? Is, is, uh, you can look up also ethically aligned design. Yeah. Um, I, I sit on the, I'm on the mixed reality committee, but there's probably 10 different committees. Um, and sort of working out these questions that you're asking in public, what, what are the ethical standards uh, for these technologies, right? Because VR in particular is, is powerful because you remove the frame yeah. for the very reasons that you're talking about, for, for better or for worse. Um, that can be used as a torture device, it can be used as an empathy machine, it can be used as a consumer persuasion device or political persuasion. Um, so please, if you're interested more in that topic, yeah. look up ethically aligned design as a part of the IEEE. But let me, let me be rude and push further and say um, there are kids dying. Uh, the photo of the, the Syrian refugee, the child, that was one photo. Even though we'd written about in text multiple times that kids and, and people were dying, that one photo of the kid dying and his mm -hmm. body draped uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the arm of the rescuer, that was really compelling. Should we shy away from reality just because it's immersed? Because that's someone else's actual reality. Um, a lot of people don't like the party. Uh, one of the first kind of, uh, it was 180 piece that kind of basically put you through date rape at a college party. Uh, that was really effective and haunting and powerful. Um, should we self-censor because we might offend someone or should we take this head on and really tough shit that you might be a little bit uncomfortable about this topic, but people are being raped on college campuses. There are kids dying to get to a safer place. That's their reality. How do you, so I'm, I'm asking, should we lean, lean in more than pull back? Look, I mean, this, these are the same questions that have been asked for every art, new art form that sure. comes down the pipe. Um, I can't answer that question. Um, I have my own views. Which are? Right. Well, <laughs> Situational, and context, and age, and experience, and there's just a lot of factors that go into sort of exposure to, to, these, to these types of media. Now I will say this, hmm. and it, so it's an oft repeat and refrain, um, and maybe it's been repeated with other art forms, with cinema, right? Well, this is too powerful. Um, this is cinema without the frame. Hmm. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't let somebody out of it, uh, yes, what can you do to them cognitively? How does it affect their development? Um, there, on a lot of these devices, it talks about age 13, right? Not, 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 for, not for kids under age 13, but that is somewhat arbitrary, to be, mm -hmm. to be frank. I mean, that's based on other mm -hmm. previous standards. Um, these current technology sets haven't been vetted fully yet. We just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Is this a mental Manhattan project that we're all sort of collectively working on? <laughs> Uh, we don't have the answers to those yet, and, and I would be lying to say that I did. Uh, so that's why it's, it's important. We're, we're getting the ethical boundaries, and it's important to have these questions and to push on those questions, even though I, I don't have a, uh, a very robust answer for it. Does anyone want to tag it on that or disagree? Or? I tend to lean forward in pushing the boundaries, but the, on the story, they're not comfortable with it. So I've. Since 2014, I've probably interviewed close to 40 Yazidi women. Um, always have a female interpreter communicating with them. I've done a, a few 360 films inside a safe house. Um, and you can really, you have to be really careful because when you're asking them these questions, they're relieving it in their head. So, you know, you have to read the room and situation and understand body language, but depending on how much 
uh, the person or the area um, um, allows us to, we'll do it. Um, but there's times where, you know, just recently we filmed a mass grave in West Mosul and we decide not to put it in it just because mm. we don't think anyone But you captured it. Oh, yeah. We captured it, but didn't. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your yeah. question. Thank you Other question, your come on up. Just come up to the microphone and ask the question. Yeah. Uh, come to the microphone just out of respect to those people who can't be here. Or I will reiterate it, I guess, if you want. Come up to the mic. Her, and then you say, oh, hey, good to see you. Uh, thank you. Is the line different between fictional narratives and real narratives, or journalistic narratives? That was going to be my, good, thank you, the question in terms of what you described in the interviewing is very journalistic, and then Kate, you guys do fiction as well. So how do you, how do you answer that question? Is the line different or not? Uh, yes, completely, and we approach documentary very different from narrative. Narrative, we will spend weeks, if not months, writing the script and planning it out, uh, doing pre-visualization, um, and documentary will come up with a set of uh, almost a visual language that's appropriate to that piece. Um, like one director likes to put the camera in the hands of the subjects. Uh, one director really likes you know, to use a drone to capture something. Um, so we'll come up with a rough guideline of, hey, we want to get these types of shots, but we'll actually go there and we'll, we'll spend time with the subjects first and, and and you know, go to different locations and shoot it like we would an actual documentary. Um, so I think there's a very big separation. No, no, no I'm but, not methodology. I mean, uh, the line between what you show and what you choose not to show, based on the fact that, like, the person watching could be like, oh, I'm looking at actors, so it's different than if I'm looking at an actual kid who's actually yeah. Yeah. in that A space. recreation using CG for body parts opposed to actual body yeah. parts? Is that a grotesque analogy? Um, I'm going to let someone else answer that then. Okay, maybe Kevin, you guys yeah. have, have kind of gone in those yeah. two. So before we were doing live action captures of like holographic people, like we were doing real people, we used to do motion capture recreation. So for one example, um, our doc that we did with Al Jazeera America in 2015 about um, the the murder-suicide of Kia Zakia Lawson, who um, basically, this is a story about South Carolina, and she was living in a trailer home. Her ex-boyfriend um, basically took her hostage and, and threatened to kill her, called the sisters, and the sisters tried to save her. And the sisters basically spent 20 minutes on the phone with the police there. Um, it's a story about you know, gun violence, really bad. Uh, violence against women um, has one of the worst rates of um, women dying at the hands of their partner in, in, the, in the country. Um, that piece, because we couldn't, you know, like do a capture with, you know, we wanted to put you in the scene and see how it unfolded and how the police reacted. So we brought the sisters to LA, had actors do motion capture of um, basically the two sisters who are survived tell what happened and they're directing motion capture artists and then we did a CG recreation of that using all real audio from their phone call to the police because everything was recorded. And the ethical line for that was not showing the murder because um, it was just too much. So um, yeah, we did not show the murder of like the actual killing. Um, you were outside of the trail home for that, but you were with the sisters and they're outside as well. Um, but it's all grounded in real audio and it's a computer gen generated motion capture of, you know, rigged characters and you're, you know, you witness what this looks like and how it unfolds. Yeah, I, that piece is a good example that I did it in a 360 video environment on the Samsung and then when I did it on the HTC Vive, even though I knew exactly what was going to happen, I still freaked out and jumped when he pulled out the gun. It's like, oh my God, he's got it. Uh, so it's really powerful. That just little your brain believes it, so there is a responsibility there. Did you want to add something? To be yeah, just, just quickly, um, it's a great question, and forgive me, what I'm about to say is that over a long enough timeline, that question becomes less and less meaningful mm -hmm. in the sense that VR is not attempting to become less lifelike, right? It's to become more lifelike. Uh, so if you look at the advantages in, in CG, in processing power, uh, th th that line's quickly going to cross. 
right? So is, is there, is there, is, do we have some sort of ethical obligation then to denote that this is a piece of fiction, this is true, how do we disclose that to the audience? Is that part of the UX? Um, I think that is an important question. It becomes sort of a, a transformative or different question as these things sort of merge. I would say, though, you don't need to cross that uncanny valley to start having these questions Agreed. in terms of yeah. uh, there's this piece done by Frontline on the brink of famine, I believe is the piece. Uh, Marcel, who's now at the New York Times, Hopkins, uh, talked about how they recorded an interview in 2D with someone who had been raped and took her kids all the way across the journey. In 2D, she's making eye contact with the people behind the camera. And then they took a 360 portrait of her. And back in New York, they realized, hey, we can merge these two. We take her static photo out and put the, three, the, the traditional flatty into the sphere. And now you're holding presence with her. And she's looking at your eyes, uh, to your eyes, and, and telling you what happened. Um, I don't know if you needed to disclose that. I don't know if it's unethical, but if you were gonna conduct that interview in 360, you would have to go outside the door and be like, hey, tell us about your rape, which is never going to be a good idea or have that um, human emotional connection to understand her journey. Uh, but those are things that are happening now. Uh, and how would you disclose that? Um, something to think about. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I have a question that sort of goes back to the previous topic, which is uh, if, if the general tendency is to lean forward into uh, showing more and more um, difficult, uh, contentious, real, true situations, uh, even with or without safeguards, um, context, uh, warnings, warning slates, or, or age gates, or, or, or whatever, even with all of those in place, do you guys think at all about creating a new level of numbness to what is around you and that having spent a career in, in journalism, there, there reached a point where everybody was incredibly interested in news coming out of the Middle East and then suddenly, or maybe not suddenly, over, over time it became so mm -hmm. regular and routine and expected that, oh, another bomb went off and another 15 people were killed, whatever. Uh, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, and, and, uh, yeah. but, but my question is, if we start exposing people to actually being on the front lines in, in uh, Aleppo or, or being on the beaches in Greece um, or or being in in you know college parties where 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 horrible things are happening. H how do we strike that balance between this is real and th these are important stories yeah. that we need to address and inundating or, or raising our sort of social and cultural level of yep I've seen that yeah. next. So, yeah, one of the reasons why I work in this and I took this job is because I watched Nani's piece um, One Dark Night and. At the time, there was a lot of news about Trayvon Martin and a lot of talking heads um, on CNN talking about his death. And, um, and then I tried her piece, which took all the real audio from the phone calls and a, a recreation of the apartment building complex that he was being chased in and the phone calls of the apartment you know, residents looking out um, at, at him being chased. Hear him, they're like saying, oh, someone screaming for help, there's someone chasing him. And that, I don't think, created a numbness at all for me. It created a completely new understanding of the news that, as me as a journalist, um, could not have gotten by. I mean, I could have read it, I could have, you know, like watched CNN, um, but it really stripped away all the things that I think is wrong with the like, current media and made me understand it. In a completely different sense. And I, and I think that's what I hope um, this type of media can do for you know, people to, to understand stories that they're sick and tired of hearing about, but in a completely new sense. Dylan, though, covering the Middle East, and I was in a war over there with those people. It's been around for a long time. I thought it was done, mission accomplished at one point. Uh, how do you keep that fresh and not noise 
How, what, what is your approach? Is that a concern that you have? Yeah, I mean, Iraq, I've been covering since the end of the U.S. war and seeing, you know, we heard about, actually, about ISIS since, like, 2012. Um, and then in 2013, uh, really, that's when they started picking up. They broke news in 2014. Um, so, yeah, I would get that a lot. I get that from my family all the time, like, even saying, they're probably saying it more just for my safety and saying it. Um, but I get that a lot. Um, why, why keep covering it? You can, you can literally Google on Facebook now, Mosul, Iraq, and see all the videos that you want to see from disgusting videos from social media to CNN docs. Um, and now you have Snapchat and Instagram. So uh, to me now, I focus on more long format investigative. Um, and 360 is really what I'm exploring is, can you do a 360 piece that takes two years time of really investigating into the story. Just how Netflix is really doing well, um, uh, taking like making a murderer, mm -hmm. like that is incredible. And I think that's kind of my focus for 360 journalism is being really specific on the story. Um, but yeah, like Iraq and Syria, you know, it does affect your, you know, pitching a story and how you want to tell that story. You have to almost have a really incredible story or it's not going to get funded. Yeah, war and conflict isn't new. The yeah. storytelling technology is. Absolutely. Kate, how do you, what do you guys see from your perspective? Yeah, I think one really important aspect of the 360 and VR journalism is you can't look away. And um, you can scroll through Facebook, you can like glance at CNN and decide to change the channel, but when you're in a headset and you don't see, you see something you don't want to look at, you either close your eyes and sit through the piece, which is really hard because it's still sound, or you turn away and, and you're still in that scene. And I, I don't know if that will prevent us from being becoming numb, but it's a pretty good tool right now. Yeah. But it, It's like different levels of numbness, right? I also think in terms of when cinema first came out and the cowboy took out his gun and shot or the train was coming, people were like, oh my God, there's a train coming, jump out of the way. After a while, we're like, yeah, it's just a train. And could that happen uh, with CG or 360? We're like, that's ah, another dead body. Oh, it's a real person? Mm, I've seen it. I saw it in you know, my game or what have you. Is that, is that, that kind of? Yeah, yeah, that was along his lines. It wasn't so much that we created the numbness I have my take too, I'll just put in my two cents and if anyone else wants to do it. It comes down to craft and storytelling, right? That's what journalism is. There's countless, uh, we'll go for a, a non-bummer story and say baseball games are happening every day and to cover that game in a compelling way, you've got to find that fresh angle, that perspective, that context. And that's what storytellers do, that's what journalists do. You have to do that and you do have to balance okay, they're not listening to this anymore. How do I find that angle? I heard an interview with someone about, um, shit, I forgot what it was in terms of like, she was talking about how schools are bad because of the infrastructure. So what they did is, uh, uh, it was a podcast, I think, that, that worked at the Seattle Times. Um, and instead, she was pitching this story and everyone was like, yeah, we get it, schools suck. It's bad for the kids. And so what they did was they flipped it and they said, let's look at what's good. And when you talk about what's good, you start to highlight the bad and how the good can uh, influence the bad. It is that fresh angle, I think, that keeps us from being numb to, to, to not be voyeuristic or just be grotesque, but to really have a purpose 
in why we're telling this story. The news peg, uh, that's, that's my answer. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Uh, just quickly, because we're running out of time, and I know there's more questions, is it, it it's, uh, let me give an Aristotelian answer. Like, what, what's the mean? Uh, there's a tension between personal responsibility and, and, and litigating ethics, right? You can't, you can't legislate morality. Um, if you give a, a, a technology set to a population of people, what's going to happen? Um, you know, how much do you regulate personal responsibility, or can you, or should you? Um, is there a is there a moderation point for individuals uh, that makes sense? Is there a reason to use VR? Do you need it for everything? No. Right? Is there a reason to a, to use AR? Do you need it for everything? No. So to be precise in the in the way that you employ these technologies in a way that makes sense for you, uh, I think is sort of the, the Aristotelian mean that maybe people need to find. Uh, sorry, I think there was one in the back and one in the front. Yeah, come up if you have questions, please. I, I think my voice was loud enough. I will work that. Sorry, and live stream really people. Recorded. And for the live stream people being no, recorded. Okay. So, I think the whole time that we're being asked these very important questions and these very important answers are given, I think we're forgetting the audience. It all comes down to who's watching and why they're watching. And um, I mean, personally, I'm at that point right now where do I shoot with a 360 or am I shooting, you know, 2D so that I can do the traditional walk of what everybody else has done and what's proven to work. This is a very um, exciting new uh, frontier that we're looking at right now, and it's cool and everything. But at the same time, if you've ever played with something that's super, like, like water, like gel, it's going to slip through your hands because you're eventually going to have so much of it you can't control it. And that's what's going on, I believe, right now, is that you, you're going to push forward and you're going to go, I'm going to show more of this content that maybe the person next to me on either side might not want to see. So I think the audience is really going to dictate this. For eons, it's happened that way. I mean, if we had somebody else on the panel who was pushing even further than you are, um, would be saying, I'm going to keep shooting it because I have an audience for that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we're kind of missing in the discussion right now is in the 60s, we had dudes that were shooting porn and people were going, oh my God, they were going out of their mind. And now what they were shooting and showing, we're seeing on billboards on the 405. <laughs> Which is kind of a counter argument to just shooting for the audience. Um, so. One of the questions that sort of a, that maybe leads to a large discussion, not necessarily for this forum, is do you just give people what they want? Uh, or are you some sort of gatekeeper, right? Um, there's a push, I think, in a lot of domains, music maybe being the, the most popular one, to back to analog. Uh, I get that, right? I see the power of these technologies. I love, on, on, on any given day almost, I, I swing back and forth with, oh my, this is amazing. I live in one of the most amazing times in human history. Right. And on, on that same, very same day, I might want to take all of my technology and throw it off the Huntington Beach Pier. Right. Right? I, I, I get those competing impulses, and they're very human. Uh, so th not to say I have a, 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 an answer to the question that you're raising about audience. Yes, certainly consider audience. Uh, but also consider the, the content that's being delivered, who it's being delivered to, and the context of it. And uh, I completely, yeah. I completely believe that and understand that. And again, as a filmmaker to be, as right now I'm going from acting to filmmaking, I don't want my granddaughter to be watching the same thing that I'm watching. So I could make two things, right? So in somebody who I'm positive you don't have children, let alone grandchildren, um, you're going to be making something a little bit different than what I'm going to be making. Um, depending on the audience, right? So I'm gonna be writing a book that my granddaughter can read as opposed to shooting something that I want you sure. and anybody else. I, I, I mean, that's with anything, right? right. Multiple right. perspectives and multiple, what's your goal with your story, right. who you're trying to, uh, right. yes. All of it is welcome. There's rated G to rated, you know, uh, NR17 or whatever, right. uh, content for everybody. You, you had a question right. as well. Yeah. Would you mind coming to the microphone? Thank you for your question. Thank you for this fascinating panel. I'm a 2D documentary filmmaker, and I'm curious about 
your experience in um, marrying the technologies in the field. So is it possible to shoot, have you shot 2D and 3D at the same time? How do you work with that footage? Okay. You know, and um, how does that differ? This, uh, I'm asking a lot of questions all at once, but in terms of distribution, you know, what audience gets what? So when you go to Sundance, how are people seeing it versus if it's on New York Times? So there's a couple questions there. A couple, I mean, let's start with the production. yeah the and the Mac the mixing, the mixing of mixing flatties up. and immersive. Like how do you guys? You we do that as well with my students. We do 2D. We do photography. We do immersive. We're right now converting a 2D uh, piece into an immersive kind of mixed piece. How do you guys work in that space? I do all the time, um, mainly because sometimes we like to um, each VR story that we do. Ideally, we like to do a 2D doc, and then maybe do a VR Halo segment of it, of telling that story in another angle. That's kind of like the ultimate goal. Um, so we're always constantly shooting VR and um, and shooting 2D at the same time, and depending on what the platform that we're working with. Um, we have that option if they want to use it or not. So that's kind of where I'm in the position, wh whatever platform or news organization we're working with, um, we have that option. Is, it, is that more cumbersome in the field to bring both um, 2 and 3D? Well, there's, there's new tech too. I don't know if GoPro's released it, but there was talk of being able to create a flatty from the 360. So you frame and you do both. Uh, but Kate, you make the rigs. Yeah. Uh, you design cameras. So, wh wh what is your response? Yeah, we've done a we've done a shoot where we shot both uh, flat and 360 uh, with um, humankind for Facebook. Um, so it was a series of both. But we and you can extract a flatty from a 360 because we use flat cameras. So what you'll do is you'll frame within that larger frame. Um, and punch in on it and do a little distortion and you can extract an image. We don't typically do that as a studio because we specialize in VR, but um, we have been asked by clients before, hey, can I deliver something later that is you know, it's an image within that 360? So it's completely possible. It's pretty difficult to do though, just being in the field as an L. If you're trying to do both, it's yeah. almost better. When someone's shooting at you or around you yeah. or something like that. Uh, Kevin, but <laughs> another way of looking at it is volumetric room scale versus 360 on Facebook. You guys have done HTC Vive and also exported to traditional. How do you guys handle those things? Yeah, so some of our experiences are, you know, like walk around room scale, you are in a space and you're moving. Um, so how do you transfer that to Facebook where that only supports 360 video? Um, so our studio kind of specializes in like doing an output, um, which is it's kind of cool because you know how in Avatar you can place, in, in the movie with James Cameron, place, he created a virtual world and placed the camera in whatever, you know, like multiply, would be a artificially created world. Um, we're kind of able to do the same thing and direct, you know, the angle inside of this virtual environment that we want you know, to shoot virtually. So we can put a 360 camera inside of this um, 3D environment with a 3D like person and kind of redirect every single angle or push the camera a bit or you know like go back and shoot however you like and that's kind of one perk of starting with volumetric and then going and convert to 360 for Facebook um, and I, you mentioned distribution um, our last project that we sold to the New York Times was also sold to Arte and they also requested that we do a long form doc and so that's something that um, the shooters in the field had thought about and they really wanted to separate the two because it was really hard for them mentally to go in between having to hide the crew, having to like be out of the frame, and then also, you know, it, it was it was just for them the way they were approaching it. They were like, we're just going to do one, and then we'll do the other. Um, so whichever works best for your crew, but they liked doing it one after the other. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I want to be greedy. I'm going to be greedy. I have a microphone, I get to be greedy. I want to end with uh, what in this space as a change agent is making you excited and worrying you? Like what, what makes you most excited? We can, let's end positive. What are you excited about this space and why are you at this space as a change agent for this topic? Uh, Kevin, and we'll go down the line. A quick answer though. What is, um, 
Uh, what am I excited about? Yeah, why, why are you working in this space? What makes this so exciting for you? Um, I'm excited to make people care about things that um, they don't typically care about and having, you know, being lucky enough to use this technology to um, tell, tell stories that don't often get told. Great. I'm excited for the education uh, part, especially where I'm based in Oklahoma, where people don't have the possibility of seeing these kind of stuff. Um, so that's what I'm passionate about is the education of it. Awesome, DC. Uh, for me, so the core interest is for the a lot, AR allows for private citizens and artists to participate in public spaces in a way that they couldn't before. It democratizes, especially city city spaces. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm most excited about uh, volumetric capture and the potential to capture um, spaces that are disappearing and uh, present them in a 3D walk around format to people that wouldn't otherwise have access. Thank you guys for that. And a round of applause for the panel. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>